Good evening and welcome to the Wakefield School Committee meeting of Tuesday, January 9th, 2018. We'll call this meeting to order and begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And we, we, we will, as we always do, read the mission statement. The vision of the Wakefield Public Schools is to graduate students who are confident, lifelong learners, who are respectful and caring members of their community. Our mission is to prepare students for college, career, and community by providing rich and challenging curriculum, high quality instruction, and educational experiences that meet their individual needs and interests. And with that, we enter our public comment period. Is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak tonight? Yes, please. All right, so I'll just um, offer my reminder. I just asked for your uh, name and address for the record. Sure. Um, just that this is not a give and take and that no personnel issues can be raised. The school committee is here to listen. And we just ask that you try to limit your comments to three minutes if that's possible. Okay. I'm Susie Bayer. My address is 15 Aborn Avenue. And I have uh, two fi uh, uh, fifth graders at the Galvin, 11 year olds. Um, good evening, school committee members. I'm here tonight interested in the critical decisions that are ahead of this committee specifically the search for the new superintendent and the need for MSBA funds to either rebuild or renovate the high school. Our, my understanding is that this committee is wholly responsible for the hiring of the new superintendent and plays a critical role in driving the process for the high school project. I, along with others in the community, are anxious to hear the plans for both of these initiatives and would like to help in any way that makes sense. I understand that the superintendent search is the highest priority, <clears throat> but also recognize that these projects are interrelated. Um, since there's a process that must be followed for the high school project that typically includes both the principal and the superintendent, um, both of whom will be leaving in late June. And it's my understanding that there's an upcoming deadline in early April, which I admit may not be a correct assumption, um, it's unclear to me whether it's critical that we have a submission in that spring time frame in order to in ensure that the, uh, the MSBA thinks that we continue to think that this project's important to Wakefield, um, even if it might make sense to wait till the fall when we have a new superintendent and a new principal in place. Um, it also is not clear to me whether Wakefield intends to continue to submit the existing proposal um, or for, the, for a rebuild or whether there's an opportunity to consider a new plan that would be a renovation which would cost less for the town and also for the MSBA to fund. While I understand that the high school project is not a formal agenda item for tonight's meeting, um, I believe it's an initiative that deserves uh, urgent attention and I'm hoping to hear more about the plan for how this critical project uh, will move forward for the town of Wakefield. I look forward to sitting to, uh, through tonight's meeting and learning more about both the superintendent search and any information that can be shared about the high school project as well, and I look forward to continuing to remain involved in the process. I'd like to close <clears throat> with a sincere thank you for the time that each of you guys donate um, to the schools for this community. Many of us recognize it's a big job um, and appreciate all that you do. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your kind words. Is there anyone else from the public who wishes to speak? Okay, we will move into our Student Advisory Council. Hello. So um, grades close January 12th officially and teachers will have their grades due by January 26th. And the first of three field trips to the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for sophomores starts tomorrow. They had to go in three groups because the sophomore is like a big class and there's only 100 Senate seats, so it would be a little uh, tight, but. Uh, hello. So um, uh, this Thursday, the 11th, and next Thursday, the 18th, there will be tours of the high school um, for 8th graders uh, at 3 p.m. Uh, they're open to both 8th graders from the Galvin and 8th graders from uh, p uh, private middle schools to uh, get an idea of what the high school is like. And in that vein, uh, this Thursday, or next Thursday, the 18th, um, the Academic Advisory Council, a student-run organization at the high school, will be hosting the Academic Pride Night, uh, in which students, and in certain cases, especially, especially those where the class's new teachers, um, 
our host booths for every class available to freshmen and answer questions from both freshmen and their parents uh, about those classes and what they might encounter and what their best options are. Learn Anywhere was used for the first time last Thursday and Friday on the snow days. Um, there will be a Martin Luther King Day celebration uh, January 15th at the Galvin Middle School will run by the Wakefield Human Rights Commission. And um, a high school student will be honored um, in we have a high school alumni, Sectra Okandaye speaking, um, in mid-years at the high school or next week from Tuesday to Friday. Thank you. Anything for our student members tonight? Ms. Morgan. Could you just let us know how Learn Anywhere worked out for you guys for the snow days? Personally, I think it worked out like really well. All my teachers submitted assignments on Classroom, and it was no different from whether we were in class, and it was all really relevant. None of it was busy work or anything, so I felt Great. that it worked out well for me. Yeah, it all seemed to play out fine. I actually take the exact same class as she does. So. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it worked out well. Okay. Great. Thank you. Mr. Liakos. I just wanted to say um, it, was, it was great to hear that uh, the students are going to the Kennedy Institute. Um, yeah. When we had our civics presentation uh, last year, um, uh, we talked about the role of field trips and um, en engagement. And I've seen their curriculum around American government and the Senate, and it's it's really excellent. Did you guys do that yourselves? When Oh, you didn't? No. Okay, because I think they start, just started that last yeah. year. Yeah. Okay. Well, good to hear. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we will move into our consent agenda, and I'll just ask for Mr. Markham's help with the motions. Certainly. Uh, the first, uh, the first and only motion on the consent agenda is the approval of minutes. And uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I request that uh, on behalf of the Labor Relations uh, Subcommittee that we withdraw those uh, minutes from consideration this evening and uh, bring them back to the subcommittee for uh, refinement. Great. We'll vote on those at our next meeting. So, uh, if I may uh, make an amended uh, motion to approve uh, the December 12, 2017 School Committee minutes and accept the December 8 School Committee finance and subcommittee minutes uh, as presented. Second. Motion's made and seconded. Any discussion? Ms. Fortier. Yeah, I have a couple of questions about the um, finance and facilities subcommittee. It, it seemed as though there was a discussion about special education and Dr. Smith put forth two possible strategies, um, depositing, it looks like depositing an increased amount of money deposited into the stabilization fund and or um, putting, I, I wasn't quite sure how, what the, what the circuit breaker uh, recommendation was. And I was just trying to figure out sort of what exactly was the sort of final thoughts. So um, we, we're really at the very beginning of that conversation. We okay. have a meeting scheduled for this Friday morning at 7.30 a.m. and then the following Friday morning at 7.30 a.m. We've invited our FinCom liaisons to come as well. Mm -hmm. And that was a very initial uh, start of that conversation. So I think I'll have a lot more information for you in an upcoming meeting. Okay. I think I'd really hesitate to, I mean, that was really just a kind of a Thinking conversation about what some of the possible directions or possibilities, but it was a rather vague, I think just sort of a beginning telling of, of where we might go. But I'm shaping it. I've been working with Mike to, to really go deeper this coming Friday. So it's a little bit early, I think, for me to, to uh, comment on that. That's fine. I, I just wasn't quite sure what direction just looking at the minutes, trying to figure That's out. That's it. We, we don't know. We don't yeah. know. We were gotcha. kind of throwing out uh, different possibilities mm -hmm. of, of how to think about special education, not only in the FY19 budget, but really for the future, for right. the longer term, some longer term forecasting and how we might, uh, you know, kind of maneuver. Yeah. Gotcha. And then I, I have one other question. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no I was reason. sorry. I was just going to suggest. Um, Maybe with the recommendation, um, because Anne is you know relatively new, a, uh, a little bit of background in the stabilization fund, how that got created, because that's you know a somewhat unique um, effort of ours. And the other thing, and I don't know if you saw this, but Mike, you had shared a, uh, a circuit breaker primer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think it was last year, 
with the whole committee, and I, yeah. I found that really um, helpful as background because this stuff gets kind of complicated. Um, so just a couple of suggestions and just kind of when we get to that point where we're having a conversation about it, maybe just making sure we all have the relevant context and background um, might be helpful. Mm -hmm. Sure. I think that'd be helpful. Sure. sure. I mean, at, at, not necessarily at, at this yeah. moment, yeah. Mm -hmm. but when we yeah. get to that point. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Great. Um, and then the other question was, um, um, Ms. Sorau noted that the MSBA Board of Directors meeting is next week, and we hope to hear from them, adding that we are a three. So I just really wasn't sure. I assume that was... Well, actually, I didn't. I shouldn't assume, but I wondered: was that related to the high school project? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, what does yeah. a three mean? Is that so good? that was prior to MSBA's final decision and kind of the final cut. So basically, oh. we um, Wakefield High School made it into the first. We went from the first group of eighty-five to the approximately, I forget what it was, 45, it's probably in the notes there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we made that kind of first big cut and they had um, posted, um, you know, schools designated them as sort of a, you know, a one, a two, or a three based on need or urgency. So we were in the second most urgent category. Um, basically, I, I remember, I'm trying to remember now, was four a more urgent category? I'm doing this off the top of my head, but regardless, three was the second to most urgent, with the most urgent being like safety considerations. So we don't really have safety issues, uh, but um, but uh, you know it was a, a, you know I think we thought that was maybe good news because we were kind of in a more urgent ca category with other districts. Um, but then we did get the call shortly thereafter to say that we did not make that final cut. Um, of districts that got in, but uh, but I, I can tell you that we are committed to absolutely uh, resubmitting our statement of interest, uh, to, you know, uh, for the high school again. And is that just once a year, like yes. a statement? Okay. Yep. And then and that happens in the fall. Is that how it worked, or was it the summer? So or the, is it the submission has to be in before April. Okay. By but before or by April, when you've already gone as far as we have, with we've had a senior site study at our. Um, school, um, the MSBA uh, actually automatically uploads your um, SOI again, and then you can make changes to it. But ours is really quite extensive and quite in depth. And uh, the woman on the phone told me it was an excellent product. She was very impressed with our educational plan. Understands our need. She says there's only so many dollars to go around. She said we will, uh, you know, if if you you know decide to resubmit. We will upload it for you. you make any changes that you need to. So, okay. that is the plan at That's this time. Mr. Yakos. So related to that, I think I had forgotten to ask about this. But if I remember correctly, last year, um, the other thing that may happen is some of the communities that are awarded um, that do make the cut um, may perhaps go through the process and decide they don't want to do their projects, right? And so those communities that are on the next on the list move up, right? Is that still a possibility so for us I this asked year? her that on the phone. Okay. I said, I, I explained to her that we were ready and willing and eager. Right. If anyone dropped out, if it looked like right. some community was unable to, um, you know, uh, financially support uh, the decision, right. that we were ready to go. She did explain to me on the phone that that was not going to be an option or that was not the process that okay. this year's selections with this year's selections. Okay. So I don't know if that's different than last year. I thought I understood it differently last year, but I did very clearly ask her and got that very clear answer Thanks. in okay. return. But yeah. so. okay. Thank you. Okay, motion has been made and seconded. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Um, Mr. Pimpling, budget items. <laughs> Good evening, thank you. Uh, in your packet, I do have my monthly reports ending December 31st through our warrant number 27 uh, on the local budget. I'll just bring out the highlights. Um, you know, we're watching the professional salaries. Uh, there was a, uh, from the, the previous month, it had gone from a surplus of 65000 down to a surplus of 35000 So uh, it's about half of our surplus went in one month. So we do need to keep an eye on that. Um, but I, do, I can say that we do have a, a few employees uh, who are on maternity leave and we are paying their substitute while they're on leave and the teacher so or the faculty member so uh, some of those will start to fall off soon so I'm optimistic there but it's something I want to keep an eye on uh, substitute number uh, par partially because of that also I'm sure um, 
we have a, a we cut that number that surplus in half also but that was this was the first month that we actually encumbered substitute salary so we just be optimistic or just be um, aware of that um, and then uh, line four in the AIDS category um, there was a, a deficit earlier of 227,000 and I had explained that that we had not um, yet transferred the uh, the faculty members who were paid out of the 240 uh, grant into the local budget or out of the local budget they were being paid out of the local budget until the grant was finalized uh, that did happen so that's why that that deficit shrunk uh, dramatically down to about 14,000 uh, on line eight under pupil transportation we cleaned up a couple of things so that that <coughs> took us to the negative that we um, we anticipated that happening but had not um, fully run through everything we need to just keep an eye on that um, line for the next couple of months to make sure that we are uh, at least holding steady if not trending in the positive um, utilities took a little bit of a dip that's the water electric and sewer that is not heating fuel that is just the um, the um, water electric and, and sewer uh, I do need to take another look at that and kind of see where where my numbers were off uh, it may have been that I had encumbered too much money in one month um, but I don't feel that there's an issue there uh, we're still in the positive just not as much as we were uh, down on instructional supplies you can see that that went from a, a, a negative of about 45,000 to a positive 127,000 uh, the, the, pay, the payment came back in on the lease on our technology the three-year lease that we did uh, what we do is we expend all the money uh, and then we we um, do what's called a lease back uh, process and we, we get the money back from the leasing company after we've paid all the bills and show proof of payment so that has occurred uh, and then heating fuel uh, is actually trending in the right direction, but I'm not sure that that's going to be the case after last week. So um, we'll, we'll try and keep an eye on it. Well, we will keep an eye on it. We'll try and hope that it, it does continue to at least hold steady or um, continue to grow. That's usually a pocket that we can uh, recoup a little bit of funds every year historically. So any questions on the local budget? Mr. Markham. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, uh, Mike. Uh, I see, we see, so it's we're looking like a just uh, just south of a one percent over budget. Correct. So right now we're over <clears> budget <throat> by three hundred sixty nine thousand, which is just shy of one percent. That would be accurate. And what are the expectations of the town accountant with regard to that? Can we maintain a negative budget on the books? Uh, because of encumbering salaries, we can, and encumbering everything, we can. Um, Okay. He just you no. Know, he he lets me run any line I want negative as long as by the end of the year it's positive. Okay. So. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. Mr. Gill is very um, understanding in that aspect, in all aspects, but especially that aspect. Any other questions on local budget? All right. Moving on to grants. Uh, just a, a quick report. I think I might have hinted at this last month, um, but it is now definitive that we are not receiving the 274 grant this year. Uh, last year that was a $27,000 grant, and we had projected receiving 27,000. Uh, in the budget process for last year. That grant is not coming thr through. Uh, fortunately, there are no salaries paid out of that grant. Uh, it is strictly for professional development. And um, uh, Ms. Ms. O'Neill and Mr. Lyons and I will uh, work out a way to, to cover any professional development obligations that we had intended to use that grant for. Uh, so that's really all I have to report new on the grant side of it. And uh, finally, in the um, revolving accounts, nothing substantial to report here. However, uh, on the preschool tuition, uh, you'll see that that went severely negative, and that's because we had not encumbered salaries in the revolving accounts. And at the Doyle, we do have um, several teachers and paraprofessionals, uh, ISPs, who are paid uh, from the tuition revolving account. So that's gone negative. Uh, you could look at last year, we were negative 130,000 at this, at this time. Uh, and this year we're 155,000 negative. So um, we are at that time of the year, we have to step up our collections a little bit. Um, and, and my staff is on top of that. So we, we should be fine for the end of the year. Um, even with the $25,000 difference from last year to this year, we did end last year with a $92,000 surplus. So I'm not concerned about ending the year positive, but I do, do want to certainly um, uh, br bring, in additional, bring in the additional revenue that's owed on that account. So. And I would also add that with the added classroom that we added this year, we did that out of the revolving account. So that, that's another reason why we're probably a little bit more negative than we were in the past. I really have uh, not much else to report on the revolving accounts. Unless there's any questions. 
Okay. Uh, the next thing in your packet, you'll just find our 2018-2019 um, or fiscal year 19 budget schedule. Uh, we are already probably about uh, a third or a little bit more down the list, fully engaged in the budget process for next year. Um, and uh, typically, there uh, the, this uh, this list is um, finance facility subcommittee meetings, meetings with FinCom, uh, meetings with uh, the public forums, teacher forums, or staff forums. Um, and then when you get down to the end, it's the town meeting, uh, additional meetings with FinCom, Board of Selectmen. Very similar to what we've done in the past. Uh, and I do have two warrant, payroll warrant number 24 and 26, I would ask for uh, a, a motion to approve. Okay, is there a motion to approve payroll warrants 24 and 26 as presented? <coughs> Move the school committee approve payroll warrants 24 and 26 as presented. Second. Motion's made and second. <coughs> Discussion? All in favor? Thank you. And finally, we do have one gift this week. This is actually a gift that was accepted at the, our December meeting. Uh, this is from the Warrior Club. However, they had um, issued us uh, a gift larger than they had intended. Uh, they had somehow um, miscounted the number of coaches, volunteer coaches that they were paying this year. So uh, the, previously, the school committee had approved a gift in the amount of 14000 and they have revised that gift to $11,400. I move the school committee accept with gratitude the donation of $11,400 from the Wakefield Warrior Club for the assistant coaches for the 2017 fall season. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Okay. Thank Is that you. good for you, Mr. Yes, Kisling? sir. Thank you very much. All right, so um, I think uh, in accommodation of our guests tonight, we'll go a little bit out of order with the committee's indulgence, and I'll just ask if Dr. Smith would be willing to do her portion of the meeting now. Yes, I'm very pleased tonight to uh, welcome up to uh, join us today our school resource officers for a presentation, uh, Officer Kelly Tobine, who is our Galvin Middle School resource officer, and Officer Jason Skillings, who is our Wakefield Memorial High School uh, resource, resource officer. These guys do great work. Uh, we're just so fortunate to have them uh, with us on our team. And so I invited them to t tell us a little bit about what they do and to engage you in um, some conversation tonight. Thank you for having us. Um, my name's Jason Skillings. I've been with Wakefield Police Department for almost seven years now. Uh, this is Kelly Tobine. Uh, she's also the school resource officer at the Galvin Middle School. Uh, is it eight years? Eight or nine years, yeah. Okay. So we've been doing uh, the job for quite a bit of time, but we both uh, put in for the position for school resource officer uh, because police work is definitely, um, majority of the time, it's reactionary work. So we're called upon and we have to react in the moment. So being a school resource officer allows us to kind of take a proactive approach, which is very nice, a uh, way of kind of giving back to the community and building relationships with the students. Um, I have some notes here, I promise, in the essence of everyone's time, I'll, I'll be brief, uh, but I do have to read from this because I'm not great off the cuff. Um, so in essence, it's the collaboration between the Wakefield Public Schools and the Wakefield Police Department uh, to assist the school in creating a, a safe school environment and to promote positive interactions with law enforcement uh, between students and uh, law enforcement officers. Uh, we can achieve this by having the opportunity to interact with students on a daily basis. Um, it also gives us the opportunity to get into the classroom setting, and we can educate um, the youth on topics such as crime prevention, criminal law, constitutional law, um, domestic violence, dating violence, drugs, alcohol, internet safety. Basically, the tools and the information necessary to help someone from becoming a victim or to even become a suspect. Um, so in addition to our activities during our regular school day, Kelly and I have also had the opportunity to bring some of our community-based uh, excuse me, community -based programs to the school. Kelly and I are both um, instructors in a program called RAD. It um, basically stands for Rape Aggression Defense. It was started uh, for women. Um, basically, it's a, a confidence-building training that empowers women of any age to escape when danger is presented. So when people think of defense, we're not teaching them how to fight. We're trying to teach them and empower them how to stop 
someone from harming them. So it could be a, a slew of things such as uh, being how to be vig more vigilant, aware of your surroundings and different techniques you can use to prevent yourself from becoming a victim. And we also teach them techniques physically how to stop someone and to prevent them from becoming a, a victim of a, a crime. Um, we've also d became instructors for the Rad Kids program, and just this past uh, winter break, we ran a class at the Galvin Middle School, which was a pretty good success. Um, it's the same idea. We teach uh, kids the self-defense techniques and empowers them um, how to stop uh, someone from hurting them, and also teaches them that to know that it's not their fault and that they can tell someone, um, because that could be anyone. It could be someone they know. It could be you know, it's not that stranger danger. It's recognizing good people versus bad people. Um, and so it basically empowers the kids. It gives them a feeling of, you know, like I, I can do something. I can call 911 and what to say, what kind of information we would be looking for. So with that, their kids are more vigilant on knowing like, okay, I need to give a description and not just, you know, someone was trying to grab me or someone was trying to hurt me. And um, basically how to uh, speak up. And the other um, thing that, that Kelly has brought me in to work with her on is the uh, Youth Mental Health First Aid, which is an eight-hour course that helps to identify some of the risk factors uh, useful in identifying mental health illness in youth. It's a 10-part series that she's brought to the faculty. And it covers, uh, you know, addressing numerous subjects such as anxiety, PTSD, ADHD, eating disorders, kind of recognizing, you know, teachers know their students, they know their kids, and, and uh, even adults, we, you know, in the community we teach parents, you know, this is the time to kind of, maybe there's an underlining issue that we need to address, whether it's someone's, you know, self-medicating with marijuana or, or um, alcohol, that could be an underlining issue there. And so it helps address that. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more on that? Sure. Okay. Um, with the Rad Women's, just to be really quick, we brought it into the high school. We thought it was really important for two things. We run two different types of programs for the high school. Um, we try and get the sports teams to do a team empowering event. Um, we try and get them before their season. We did it with the girls' hockey team, um, and it was really it was good. They did it as a group before their season, and they went into their season with a lot of power and confidence. We also run another group that we, we've done before where we target the senior and juniors and their mothers. So when they go off to college, moms know what their kids know and their kids know what their moms know. Um, puts everyone's anxiety a little bit more at ease. A lot of times um, people might not have been, I know hockey, obviously girls are in physical, you know, uh, a game, but it, sometimes you're not, you've never been in a fight and you don't know what you're capable of. So this gives them that opportunity. You don't, we don't have the picture in the slide, but as I dress up as an aggressor and I have this big, I call it the Big Hero 6 outfit. It's like a big padded suit and I'm covered head to toe. And I play the role of an aggressor. And it, all the things that we taught them throughout the week, um, they have to use on their own. So there's no one there to tell you, let's practice these moves or whatever. They use their own, and then we play the video, and they look at it, and they're like, wow, I can't believe I actually did that. I didn't think I could. And I, I don't let go or give in easy until I know, okay, that is an effective move that definitely would have stopped somebody. And so nobody, you know, people in our experience, um, someone who's going to commit a crime or uh, assault somebody, they're looking for an easy target. So this is going to teach them to prevent that from being an easy target. Uh, moving on to Rad Kids, Jay and I did the Rad Kids program. We got certified last year. We've ran three camps since then, um, two in the summer and one in December. It's great. Uh, we teach everything from if a dog comes up, you know, what's the position you get if a dog's going to bite you, to how to answer the door or who do you talk to. But most importantly, we ask them, who's the most important person in the school? And at the beginning of the week, it's always the principal. At the end of the week, it's themselves. So that's changing their mindset. We change their mindset in the Rad Women's, and we try and change their mindset in the Rad Kids as well. Um, kids need to recognize that it's not their job to help adults. I know that sounds crazy as it is. Uh, but, you know, a parent obviously has, you know, the power to, to, to discipline and tell the kids, I need your help with something, and they recognize that. But they don't always have to help every adult because they need to recognize whether the person's a good person or a bad person. So this helps empower them with that information. 
The youth mental health first aid um, we brought to the Wakefield Public Schools about four years ago. I think we've taught over um, 100 to 120 teachers along with many community members. Um, we host it at the police station. We've hosted one at the BB Library. Um, and it just, it just teaches um, parents and teachers, whether they use it in their classroom or at their home, you know, when is it time to get someone help? You know, what's the straw? A lot of parents and teachers don't know when is the time do I step in? Do I help my brother or sister? Or do I help my son or daughter? So it really draws some line in the sand and it opens up the opportunity to talk about DCF and when do we report? And it just gives the opportunity, it gives us the opportunity to talk a lot more than and what we normally would talk about. Um, so it's great. We are doing a five-part series with the Galvin and the high school teachers who signed up to take our course. And then we also have a five-part series with pre-K through fourth grade as well. Kelly and I are uh, critical incident uh, trained, so CIT officers. And there's, um, I'd say, about 12 of us total yep. in the department. Eventually, the whole department will be. And basically, it's getting training on the different types of mental illnesses and how to de-escalate someone in crisis. I find that those techniques work in every aspect of life and dealing with the regular public. Um, so it's it's been great learning these things and being able to teach other people the different techniques. Because once you go, you can go zero to 100, and once you reach 100, it's hard to come back down again. So how do you get to a point where you can bring somebody down without getting hurt or... Um, some of the additional ones that we do, we help out with and we partner with the community is the in-plain site. You'll see sometimes it's hosted at the town hall. Um, the parent university, we always have a breakout session and we help with the Alice drills in the school. But this wouldn't be, we wouldn't be able to do the things that we do without our community supporting um, the people who either donate money for books or for food or whatever we ask for. They're always there saying, yes, how can we help you? Um, so thank you to our community providers, Wake Up, Wave, the Sheridan, the Savings Bank, WCAT, Wayfield Co-op Bank, and the Rotary um, are our biggest donors. So we appreciate it. Thank you. And again, thank you for letting us speak today and share what we've been up to and what we'd like to continue doing within our community and the schools. Well, thank you both for being here. Sure. Sorry, Dr. Smith. No, I was, just, I was just going to add, too, that um, both uh, Kelly and Jason are critical partners of mine in preparing for our monthly district crisis team. We meet as a district crisis advisory committee ahead of time to plan all of the agendas, and they've just been wonderful resources for that, too. So I just want to give them a nod for their role in district crisis and emergency planning as well. Thank you. committee. Ms. Liakos. Thanks. Thank you uh, for giving us this update, and thank you for the work that you do with our students. Um, I imagine that um, um, one of the uh, hardest parts of your, um, one of the most challenging parts of the work that you do is, is building relationships of trust, right, with the students. And um, part of that, I, I imagine, is balancing um, your role as a school resource officer with just your role as a police officer, right? And you're, you're trained, you're, as a police officer, you're trained largely uh, initially to investigate crime, right, and, and, uh, and solve, um, you know, solve problems. Mm -hmm. How do you guys balance that role, the role of, uh, of a law enforcement officer and mm -hmm. your responsibilities versus that of uh, a mentor and uh, you know a presence uh, an adult pre a trusted adult presence uh, where you have to build those relationships of trust with the students I, I think it's a team approach um, a lot of times either it's us teaming up um, and really seeing what we're good at and what we're not good at and being able to identify but also you know when we talk since I'm at the Galvin we have we handle a lot of things at the team approach, and I know Jade is too at the high school. Um, and when we're, we're talking about a situation, how we're going to handle something, you know, I'll say to the administration, let me play this role and you play that role, and vice versa. Or, you know, I know people have dealt with us before, the yeah. family's dealt with us, so I'm more apt to take different roles. And, um, you know, it, we always switch up and it's always a team approach so mm -hmm. we never we're not there for discipline we're right, there to right. be a bridge and a right. gap right. Um, which a lot of people sometimes don't understand 
they come in and they ask us to do something and we say, no, that's not really our job. Yeah. Um, and the team you're referring to really is, uh, is, is as wide as their teacher, that student's teacher, perhaps a, um, it's a everything. school it's, psychologist yep, or principal. It's a principal. school psychologist. Yep, yep. It's their yep. outpatient providers. Right. It's the Parents, police. Right. It's yep. the other. Yep. It might be the officer who went to the house last night. Yep. You know, it, yep. it's everyone who wants to be or is involved with this kid is who comes to the meetings. We also have discretion as police officers, too. And so a lot of things we try to handle and keep at the school level. Right. Right. And, um, you know, obviously there's certain crimes that are committed that we have to right. get involved um, at, at a, investigated at a police level. So yeah, that dual hat, so to speak. Right. But to be able to build that trust is being able to get into the classroom. Uh, right now I get into the, the health classes and I also, Barrett, Mr. Fitzgerald has a criminal law class that he'll have me come in and be a guest speaker. And mm -hmm. Sometimes I don't know the answer, and sometimes I do, and it, it kind of humanizes me yeah. within the students. And, and I, I try every day to smile and wave hello to as many kids as I can um, to build that trust. It's a lot harder at the high school level, but I love going to visit Kelly at the middle school. Or we, we both tag team at the elementary schools because we're like rock stars when we walk through. <laughs> both um, want to be first in the door. Yeah. <laughs> uh, doing the rad kids, like I have kids come up to me and they're like, I know him, Officer yeah. Skillen. You know, kids yeah. actually wanted an autograph. It's kind of cute. Um, so hopefully they remember that when they get to yeah. high school. Yeah. Um, and, and they do. And yeah. they do, yeah. yeah. So th th there's that, but it's definitely, like uh, Kelly was saying, it's that team approach um, because it shouldn't be one person taking on that. It should be a group effort. And the other thing I just want to quickly mention is that if there is a situation we have mainly um, with drugs and alcohol, for instance, um, Wakefield Police has also uh, developed a diversion program which is basically, rather than someone get into the court systems, we offer the ability for the kid to take part in our diversion program, which is the learning aspect. There might be some community uh, uh, service, uh, an education piece to it, um, maybe some disciplinary. But it's addressing what those underlying issues might be. Maybe this is a substance abuse problem. Maybe there's a mental health issue. So rather than just kind of they go, no court wants to give a juvenile a record but you know before it would be okay you don't do anything wrong for six months to a year this will go away but there's no education piece there so this allows that to happen mm -hmm. great so. thank you Ms. Warrior, please. so I can totally appreciate all of the work you do um, particularly around the the rad programs and and empowering uh, folks to certainly not be victims. I'm wondering if there are any programs that you know of that could be used uh, to empower people who wouldn't ordinarily be thought of as victims to not be perpetrators, for example. You know, I was thinking when you said you were talking to a sports team um, and, you know, it was the girls hockey team thinking about their involvement with RAD, and my mind went, I wonder if there are programs with, say, you know, working with the boy sports teams, because mm. um, they're already a team, they have each other's back, to just learn how um, to support each other in being, you know, making good decisions, being not being bystanders, um, you know, not making inappropriate jokes or, you know, mm -hmm. so sort of promoting kind of good well, behavior. The uh, RAD program has many, they have a, a RAD elderly training. They also have a, a, um, a men's. A RAD men. RAD men's. We, mm -hmm. we haven't actually looked into that, but that's, that's a good point. We could look into that. Maybe there's a piece of component to that. But uh, Kelly and I are both are on Wake Up and... Um, and within that coalition, we we try to address those some of those issues and try to bring different ideas of how we can, you know, bring some you know the bystander uh, training or not be uh, you know speak up and not just uh, let someone abuse another or that kind of or the bullying aspect. So we are definitely open to ideas and suggestions and how to bring that forward. Um, and if someone knows of a program, we'd be more than happy to listen to it and uh, help them out. 
Yeah, I think it would be great to continue to sort of promote a culture of acceptance and, and compassion. Um, and you know, and, and sort of targeting all of you know these groups that are already put together. Mm -hmm. um, sure. I think that would be a, a useful thing. So, sure. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. Um, first, I'd just like to thank you both and your fellow officers for what you do for us every day. Mm -hmm. thank um, you. Second, I took the RAD course several years ago, and it was so impactful. I remember after the aggressor situation a lot of the women in the class had an emotional reaction once you're actually done with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think it's awesome. I didn't realize you were offering it at the high school. I did see the kids rad on Facebook. I saw some pictures from that. Mm -hmm. I think it's awesome. If there's anything we can do to help with enrollment, mm -hmm. please let us know. Yeah, I think we, um, we tried to put it out last June and it, we put it out a little too late. The seniors were already in senior yep. mode and mm -hmm. in senior week, um, but we're gonna try and and grab another hopefully class in the spring great yeah initially we tried the just the senior approach going off to school but i think it was a nice thing to do for the team aspect of mm -hmm. it so i'd like to see is even some faculty like a uh, some of the, the women teachers or faculty yeah. take the class because that will help promote it within the students as yep. well so that's our goal but as many people want to do it, we'll we'll try to get a class put together and it's all about timing and the and the great thing is it's free yeah mm -hmm. So it's great if anyone's interested. Yeah. All righty. Well, okay. just with the thanks of the school thank committee for all that you do, thanks for coming tonight. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you very thank much. You very much. All right. And my next guests are Principal of Wakefield High School, Rich Metropolis, and Director of Guidance, AJ Beebe, to present to us the uh, program of studies for 2018-19. Good evening. Um, I was wondering too, just a, as a, an aside or in addition to what uh, the resource officers were talking about, just to answer or talk about a couple of points, um, the diversion piece that Jason had brought up that's in the community, a lot of local schools have that associated with their student handbook as well, it's something that we're looking into to incorporate for our handbook next year. Um, so it gives some students some leeway in terms of, you know, whether it's suspension time, if it's a first offense, how do we... Um, educate students on maybe making better choices uh, versus you're out for five days or out for how many days and and that's that. Um, the other piece too um, is for year is the uh, the MVP program. You talked about kind of empowering student leaders. Uh, we do have a program in place uh, and uh, it's supported by a grant um, which uh, Mr. Kent had applied for a couple of years ago. Uh, so we have a bunch of students who have been trained through that. Um, it's called Mentors in Violence Prevention. It's a program that we run. Uh, and that's the student group is um, in the process of generating programming that will make its way into our building um, on a regular basis. So we're addressing some of the, uh, the points in our um, YRBS uh, results um, with regard to dating violence and, and, uh, and, and violence among students. So we do have that programming and uh, we're looking to expand it as well. So. We sidetrack back to our program of studies, so I apologize for that. So good evening, everybody. Um, I'd like to per, um, announce the <coughs> opening of our program of studies for the 18-19 school year. Um, you have the uh, program of studies that was in your packet. We have the proposed changes in front of you that'll be our guide to the curricular offerings for next school year. They are reviewed annually by the department leaders to ensure that programming at Wakefield High School best serves students' needs and the college and career planning readiness outlines that we have. During the student-centered uh, schedule building process, student enrollment and course offerings will be reviewed. Courses with low enrollment numbers will not be offered, and it's also understood that the limits in staffing will determine the school's ability to offer all courses in the catalog each school year. Procedurally, what will take place is that all students complete their course selection prior to the February vacation. The tallies will be given to the department leaders to allocate their staff, and they will meet with Mr. Metropolis to have his final approval on those allocations. Once that data is available, we will start to build next year's master schedule on how it will flow. In order to assist students and families in arriving at a well-thought-out collection of courses, 
The guidance team will meet with all students in the district in small groups from grades 8 to 11. After the presentation, students are recommended to discuss their choices with their parents, their teachers, their guidance counselors, and their peers. The eighth graders, in particular, have an action-packed opportunity to consult multiple sources coming up. They will be visited by the high school guidance staff this Thursday on the 11th. They will be able to tour the high school after school on the 11th and the 18th next Thursday, courtesy of the student council, their student-run tours. Students are also invited, as Chris had mentioned earlier, to attend the fourth annual Academic Pride Night next Thursday night. That will also have tours that evening. I'd like to plug those as well that are put together by um, the student council as well. Academic Pride Night is put on by the Academic Advisory Council. It's a collection of students that also have input into the program of studies, but actually build and produce that whole evening, which is a great addition to our programming. And finally, parents will be given the same information that the students have been given on the next Thursday on the 25th with, with eighth grade parents night. This process will conclude with the eighth grade students being recommended for their classes by their teachers by February 9th through IPASS. We're going to do online uh, recommendations with the eighth graders this year. It's a new initiative. And parents and students and teachers should share their thoughts with each other and their ideas about course selection during this time frame. A course verification sheet will be sent home with each student once these selections are made and are all input, and then parents will have an opportunity at that point to adjust or override teacher recommendations and return those to me at the guidance office for adjustment. So that's the timeline for where we're heading to have next year's schedule online. And then Mr. Metropolis is going to talk about the changes that are in the program from last year to this year. So I think you saw in your packet, we do have a couple of just um, some technical changes, um, but one has to do with uh, adding graduation requirement. Um, so one of the things that we've gleaned from a lot of years of discussion, really, from the health department as well as our, our wellness teachers and uh, some discussion in the community, YRBS results, uh, that we need more health education at the high school level and we're looking to implement that for next year for our current ninth graders moving into 10th grade so they would be taking two years of health um, health is on a semester basis and it mirrors wellness so students take ninth grade health first semester they take a, ten, a ninth grade wellness second semester um, vice versa as well so uh, we, we would like to implement the same type of programming for sophomore year. Uh, it's not a tremendous impact on the student's schedule uh, by any stretch. Uh, it meets, I believe, two times out of six mm -hmm. days, uh, a six-day cycle. But it's an opportunity for us to expand upon the curriculum that we already have, we already purchase. Uh, currently, right now, the health teachers opt for certain topics, um, and they come up and, and discuss their curriculum. Uh, now they're able to expand upon that. And we're looking to, you know, utilize some of those health topics in an effort to, to minimize um, the, uh, the higher numbers in our YRBS survey uh, and, and, you know, obviously some of the, uh, the needs that are ongoing. Um, we attempted to do it a couple of years ago with a, um, I guess it was like an 11th, 12th grade option for health as an elective. Uh, and very few students opted to take it, so we didn't, we didn't run the class. Um, uh, we do feel like it's at the point where a graduation requirement is, is necessary, and, and I believe that that's um, a strong recommendation, uh, not only from myself as the principal, but all the other pieces of data that we've been collecting over the years. Um, in terms of the withdrawal change, uh, that's a, a technical piece. Um, students have about, uh, they've currently had about 10 days to, to decide whether to stay in a class that they have previously chosen the spring before, We'd like to minimize that from 10 to 5. Um, realistically, uh, it, it does uh, change the nature of our scheduling a lot if students are flowing from one place to another um, really 10 days into the schedule. Uh, as Mr. Beebe said, it's a student-centered um, scheduling process. So what that means is that we allocate uh, teaching sections based on where students uh, opt to take classes in addition to obviously meeting their requirements. Um, but if students opt to take certain elective classes and we build the schedule based on those elective classes existing and then some students opt to change within 
a longer period of time, then we find our, our class uh, numbers and our, our class sections being a little out of whack. So we'd like to minimize that. We'd really like to stress, and I know the counselors do this now, we'd really like to stress the idea that when you're opting for a class uh, in the spring to take the following year, that, that you know, really you're committed to that schedule. Um, and, and it's uh, it's not a um, uh, not a bad thing by any stretch. These students are are counseled um, not only with their counselors and their teachers, uh, but parents as well to make those quality decisions. So um, we do offer uh, a couple of changes in grade levels in an effort to. Um, to, to meet that uh, health requirement for 10, we have to do some shifting. Uh, we're not act asking for any additional staff in order to meet that need, um, but we're shifting some of the classes that uh, some teachers within that certification area have taught in the past. So uh, a common 10th grade elective is, is um, food and nutrition. Uh, we're going to opt to not run that. Um, and then we need to find some spaces within the schedule uh, for elective classes for ninth graders. Um, Beyond uh, maybe meeting an arts requirement, uh, or, or where we can where we can find a, a space, um, so we're opening up some of our uh, electives to ninth graders. I think it's going to be a great opportunity. Actually, um, I, I can understand why they weren't open to ninth graders originally, but I think we've we've had some conversations with the department coordinators and find that. Um, but there's tremendous opportunity there uh, if people are going to get involved. Um, and so, that, therefore, the ELA change of, of creative and technical writing opening to grade nine, um, we'd like to offer uh, a, a new Shakespeare class, whether whether it runs or not. It all depends on how it fills. Like I said, uh, student-centered schedule. Um, we'd like to create a, a support for students who are just starting the world language process at the high school. Um, we've we've often had a kind of a one A one B, and then students moving into Spanish two after those, um, and it doesn't necessarily always translate to a success. Um, the 1A and 1B is a lot of it's about culture and ingraining themselves into the experience of learning a language. Um, and so it doesn't always uh, translate to, I know the requisite amount of vocabulary and grammar and, and, and um, speaking and, and, and writing uh, that um, the students can meet with success at Spanish too. Um, so we'd like to add that component in to, to have them uh, meet Spanish 1. Uh, and and then, then they would meet their graduation requirement, but also feel confidence to stay within the language for another couple of years. Um, uh, in terms of uh, mathematics and business and the science, technology, and engineering and social studies areas, um, we used to have a business department, um, and we've dissolved that. We dissolved it towards the end of last year, and um, that uh, those classes haven't dissolved, they still run and they still exist within our programming, but we've moved them to fit within um, departments that also make sense. So, for example, uh, math has uh, taken on a lot of business-based classes. The technology classes or computer-based classes that were in that department, which was sort of, you know, it used to be called business and technology and culinary arts. We've, we've, we've again, spaced it out so it makes a little bit more sense. So that technology piece moving in with the sciences um, and then uh, in terms of some of the advanced placement classes that we've run, uh, economics, human geography, we're actually looking to expand upon with another one uh, called AP Seminar and AP Research. Um, these are kind of student-driven classes. It's a two-year experience. It's, it's really a, an interesting thing. Um, but they fit really well within the social studies department. Uh, and we, again, you'll see we've, we've expanded opportunities for ninth graders in the Holocaust class as well as a potential cultural studies class. Um, I will say, and just to put in a plug, uh, we've been um, recognized by the college board again um, as, uh, um, what's it called, AP... Honor roll, AP honor <laughs> sorry. Uh, but it's about expanding opportunities for students to take AP classes without having a, a, a dip in our scores or our achievement level. I mean, and granted, achievement level is achievement level, right? But we like expanding opportunities for kids. And then what the um, college board likes is that our achievement level hasn't dropped. Um, so we're really proud of that. Um, 
just a couple of other kind of technical changes uh, throughout the rest, uh, name changes, et cetera. Um, but I think uh, overall, uh, not a huge amount of changes to our programming, but I think, uh, again, suiting the needs of today's learners and, and, and what the data suggests uh, for needs uh, among our students. Thank you. School committee. Sorry. I just have one question for Mr. Beebe. Did you say that the eighth graders were going to register for select courses online? The eighth grade teachers are going to do recommendations <coughs> online. The recommendations are yes. going to be online. Yes. Do you think we'll ever get to a place where this could be done? The the the, the selection yes. could be done online. Mm -hmm. Correct. Students being selecting them right. online. There's three prongs to the program, um, the teacher input and the student and the parent piece of it. Mm -hmm. We're just exploring now the teacher input of it. It's, um, I guess, as difficult or as simple as it is, it's easy to do at the middle school level because they're the only ones that are doing input would be the eighth grade team because mm -hmm. nobody else builds the way we do in an elective fashion. Mm -hmm. The middle school, it's pretty much all input. Uh, inputting data but there's no selection per se to it so what we're actually doing now is piloting how does it look how do the teachers do it how do we get that information back to students and parents to be able to evaluate what's been input and that's why I mentioned in my part of the presentation is people should be having those discussions now so that what's input is agreed upon per se with the teacher the student and the parent mm -hmm. and it's very smoothly done as, as, you, as you know we do it in a paper form right now at the high school level and at the middle school, which is a lot of data entry. A lot of paper gets passed back and forth. And it's it's just not time efficient right. when the program can do it. So we're going to go through it and take the kinks out of it with the eighth grade, get it right, bring the parents and the kids on board into that process probably next year. And then as we see how that rolls out, train all the teachers at the high school and the kids will already know how to have done it because they did it in eighth grade mm -hmm. as they scale up here. But th that definitely is the goal. So that's why we decided to do it kind of in a pilot with one group that's all inclusive. Gotcha. Well, that's exciting. Yeah, As it is. Parent, it's very exciting. And I'm it sure it's going to have its kinks to it, but I pretty much strategize those pieces of it. Yep. I can see it happening. And if we have to do a little bit more legwork and go visit the kids at the middle school, we can do that. Uh, Mr. Tetralt and I work very well together in this process through the eighth grade. I don't see any problems with it. And I'll put in a plug for the whole thing. I think it was one of the uh, ideas that I had going forward to be able to do this. We had a few bumps in the road over the summer with certain people going to elementary schools. They kind of left me with my hands tied a little bit to <laughs> investigate this. So uh, Wendy Phillips has really been the spearhead of kind of um, driving this at the middle school and working with the eighth grade teachers to get them on board. The impetus for it, again, I'll even put in another plug, is the eighth grade teachers have really been looking forward to having this ability. Mm -hmm. So this isn't anything that uh, we're driving at them. They've been asking for it and we're kind of delivering. So it's really kind of a uh, team effort to pull this together as a district, not school, high school, middle school. So it is, it's very exciting, but I do see, you know, certain pieces of it being a little um, difficult logistically. But the verification sheets going home will give people the opportunity to mm -hmm. see what they don't see kind of electronically. Because right. they don't have the means right now to teach people how to find everything and respond to things electronically. It's come a long way with the iParent piece and people having access, but I'm not sure it's a place just yet to have all this kind of technical information out there that's so critical for people to see. Mm -hmm. I'd rather run off a few pieces of paper and send them home to people. And have make sure people are having these conversations that they're not having over the paper, having an in-person as well. Gotcha. Good. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. Um, thank you for uh, the update and all the information you provided uh, to us tonight. So uh, I was wondering if you, you both might uh, uh, elaborate a little bit more on the rationale behind the health and wellness changes mm -hmm. and um, uh, help us also understand those um, those concepts that was even reading, you know, the, the categories, health, life skills, and culinary arts, and the wellness category, you know, um, these things are evolving, right? And and, sure. and as it relates to traditional physical education, too. And, mm -hmm. and you know, of course, I was thinking, I imagine some of my colleagues were, too, is, you know, the emphasis on this in, in part is, and tell me if I'm wrong, 
yeah, in part, um, you know, a concern for, um, you know, the generations of kids coming up, um, and many of them so um, uh, comfortable with technology, um, and such, uh, in some ways, the technology becoming so, in many ways, addictive, um, and making sure that we as a school system emphasize the role of, you know, physical health mm -hmm. and wellness. Um, but then also, you know, some of the things we heard about with the youth risk behavior survey and um, um, how we as a school system can, um, can encourage, you know, good, good practices, good behaviors and um, healthy, you know, uh, lifestyle. So mm -hmm. all of that, maybe if you guys could talk about that in that context, that'd be great. Sure. So, I mean, I, I think one of the things that we always struggle with is when we have a class on the books that we've had on for, for many, many years, like food and nutrition, yeah. we've tried to evolve that curriculum a little bit to talk about in general health and wellness, yeah. right? Um, it's taught by a certified wellness teacher and person is also dual certified in health and wellness. Um, but uh, it's an elective. Right. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things that we've also encountered is that through that elective process, and you know, we, we've evolved, I think, maybe, I don't know if it was, it's under 10 years ago, but moving to a, uh, a wellness component where every year a student has to take wellness, gym, I yeah. visit. <laughs> um, um, but we also want to expand and connect the health classes to that. Uh, and so we were able to do that with our freshman year health and wellness kind of tandem semester classes. Um, but it's not a lot. It's yeah. not a lot of time um, uh, on, uh, on learning those particular topics. And, uh, and we do invest in, a, in a, a robust curriculum, one that does talk about um, health uh, with regard to internet safety screens and, and, yeah. and obviously uh, just maybe a lack of movement, right? Yeah. Um, so that it's really important that we are able to get at all the topics and uh, moving on to a sophomore health with a wellness component. So having this bridge and connecting them. I mean, is it possible that in years to come we're able to build, whether it's either one class essentially called health and wellness, um, or that as we get in the higher grades, those wellness classes are a lot more um, kind of elective based and it's not like okay I'm going to a phys ed class in the gym where we might play volleyball or we might decide to run the track for a, a little bit of time it's you know is there a uh, um, uh, weightlifting class yeah, or a, a, what's that yoga. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure yeah. Or yoga or me, you know some type of meditation class right. uh, is there you know is there a, not, not necessarily a, a cooking class but food prep class that you know, is somehow connected to the curriculum, but with a, with a more specific um, uh, goal or topic in mind. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity for that, but we also want to make sure that students have um, kind of some of the traditional standards of, of, of health, and we just haven't had the time for that. So okay. now we do, or we will. Could you just maybe tag on to that, that yeah. as a, at a district look, um, Brendan Kent is really yeah. working with the team and Doug Lyons to yeah. Think about a, a K to twelve curriculum that's more integrated, where we're looking, we're not looking at physical education, and health and nutrition, yeah. and social emotional learning or mindfulness as separate components. But there's it's kind of an integrated look at right. overall wellness. How do those all of those things kind of work together? Your physical health yeah. and your emotional yeah. health and right. your, you know, nutritional health. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're rolling it out in pieces. We're doing some long-term visioning right now. We've been talking about actually quite a bit in the last right. uh, last couple of weeks and kind of mapping and planning for the future. But ultimately, that is the vision is from K through 12, mm -hmm. kind of an integrated model that, you know, moves through. Mm -hmm. Right. I think I'd throw in my two cents to that is historically we did have a two-semester component uh, graduation requirement where we had junior health years ago. So this is kind of regaining what we lost through budget cuts years ago. Um, so it's not a major leap. It's going back to where we were at, at one point. And I think the other part of it, Greg, is that we want all kids to be exposed to this. Mm -hmm. And we know that we need to have that. So the making it a requirement and putting it in the 10th grade seemed to make sense with a lot of the research that we've seen and what Brendan was after and what we wanted to get back. And we were able to kind of repurpose what we felt was going on kind of in a foods and nutrition setting, but in an elective sense for 60 kids. So we're able to kind of use those resources to create something again uh, up to date for all kids to be able to have access to. 
and we'll see if I can do it. Uh, first of all, I just want to congratulate you guys on being recognized for more AP classes. That's fantastic. Um, secondly, just to kind of clarify, going off of that, um, is it basically a classroom setting for the first half or second half of the year, mm -hmm. and then basically gym phys ed for the, the other? Yeah. That's um, it, it is, 9 through 12, it right? It is right now, and it's nine, ninth grade has the health class. It's in a classroom setting. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so like let's say if you took health first semester, second semester you have a wellness class. Yeah. Um, as a sophomore, it would be the same thing. Uh, and then um, right now, uh, for 11th and 12th grade, it's just a semester of wellness. So there is no uh, health, but um, like Dr. Smith said, there's open discussions about how we kind of integrate health and wellness, nutrition, kind of well-being, uh, social-emotional health, pre-K to post. Uh, and I actually think it will have an impact on all of our academic classes as well. I think that, you know, we have a, a fairly traditional building and, and um, it does kind of allow for a, kind of a traditional mindset for how students learn. Uh, we've seen a lot of changes in that. Um, and I think that as we integrate more health and wellness initiatives, topics and curricula, pre-K to post, we'll see it have an impact on how people interact within the classroom setting. Um, so it's just one yeah, of those things that that's I think great. Is I think that's beneficial. Yeah. <clears throat> Ms. Morgan. You mentioned early on in your presentation that you sometimes won't run courses due to low enrollment. Right. Is there a number tied to that, or is that case by case? It's interesting. It's a, it's a case by case, but it also yeah. depends upon, um, it does depend upon a number. So, you know, if, if we had um, students who started taking French, for example, in the middle school, and then they got to the high school and enrolled in a, uh, a French 3 or French 2 class as a freshman, French 2, French 3, French 4, and then French 5 AP. So it's sometimes a small number. It could even be six. Mm -hmm. um, but we have a conversation, talk with the coordinator, and, and determine, you know, mm -hmm. will this really benefit those five students to have this advanced placement opportunity so that I make a decision that that teacher's section is even going to have five students. Mm -hmm. And granted, you know, it, I think there's an equity piece um, but it's important to run it sometimes. Yeah. Um, other classes, though, uh, they don't necessarily feel the same way, or they might not, I'm not going to say that they don't have the same value. They do have a, a tremendous amount of value, but it all depends on kind of the expectation and, and how we can best support kids um, who are enrolling in something to really benefit them and their transcript at this particular point and for perpetuity. Right. Yeah, and sometimes you run some of those lower numbered classes to sustain a program, mm -hmm. and they do build and, and rejuvenate yeah. themselves yeah. over time. But one of the other reasons that I mentioned that kind of caveat to it is, is there's more courses in this book yeah. than we have teachers to teach. So inherently, it's just not going to get all spread around. Mm -hmm. But we want kids through a student-generated schedule to be able to have choices. Mm -hmm. And where those choices kind of land is where we ask the department leaders to, and the principal to make decisions on allocating that staff that they have. But we're not going to say, like, well, because last year this didn't run, this didn't run, stop putting it in the book and take it out and mothball it. You know, it, it's, it's not up to me if it's relevant to the curriculum, what goes in the book of the department leaders. We let the kids kind of make those decisions. Great. And Thank that's you. where, you know, the engineering courses and things like mm -hmm. that have kind of taken over and, um, you know, some of the other electives will will drop down and yeah. maybe they'll come back around again. But It's not just about popularity, too. It's about meeting the needs of kids. Yeah. So, like, for example, Mr. B brings up the engineering class last year. You know, obviously, I remember coming here and talking about the opportunity to create an engineering class. It was an investment. We were able to meet that investment uh, w with the support of the school committee, which has been awesome. So not only did we run two, one class, we ran two, just because of how popular it was. Uh, here, we'd like to offer an introductory engineering class. So you can see already that we've just, like, in two short years, uh, I'd say four or five years, mm -hmm. we've really expanded these kind of comp tech engineering opportunities um, we haven't not run other things as a result of that but we've really tried to balance it um, to best support the needs of kids and what they want um, so thank you yeah. excuse me and so thank you both uh, very much gentlemen and and also please pass along to the 
other teachers and, and guidance counselors that I know there's an awful lot of work that goes into this. This is not uh, a, uh, <laughs> this is not a task that you began a couple of weeks ago. This is something right. that is probably it, ongoing and never ending. <clears throat> um, but it's a critically important one to evolve and and um, and, uh, and 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 the work shows. Uh, so a, a, a couple of questions. Hopefully, um, they may be they may be quick ones. One, uh, I see you've used the, the words um, that some courses have been absorbed and others have been eliminated. <clears throat> Help uh, describe sort of the difference um, and what goes into the decision making to uh, to retain a course and make it part of another versus uh, to eliminate it altogether. So, in terms of absorbed, what we're saying is that course has been absorbed into another department. Um, basically, we had that kind of business, comp tech, culinary department, which was an amalgamation of multiple topics and curricula. Uh, and and once that, uh, once we had an opportunity to kind of dissolve that okay. department, we basically had what, what made more sense in terms of an alignment for absorbing those classes. So I think there's a okay. kind of a natural absorption for mathematics and business. So there's a natural connection. So social studies and AP Human Geography. AP Human Geography used to reside within the business department. I think for me it makes sense for the social studies department to absorb it. Uh, in terms of the elimination, it really is that food and nutrition piece. We do want to be able to offer the the software health opportunity. Um, that that um, food and nutrition class is an elective. And although, again, the curriculum did evolve and we have a, a great teacher for it, that great teacher can also bring in some of that curriculum into the health topics that all students have to take. So I, I feel like it's, it's worth, you need to say elimination, but it's worth bringing that curriculum to another space versus hoping kids take it and then you know granted those kids would get a benefit from it but uh, it's not all kids okay well that that actually helps inform my second question okay. which may be moot but i'm going to ask it anyways <laughs> <clears throat> um the, the the some of the reorganization the creation of a new department sort of a stem department it's not you know, calling it that right science technology engineering department yep and saw bringing math and business together. Uh, so uh, are we a net uh, loss or gain in the number of departments, if you will, um, or is a reorganization sort of? Um, um, I mean, I think we, we've definitely moved one department, split it right. um, into three different areas. So yeah, we, we've, we've been able to reduce one department, but we haven't reduced any um, faculty members. We've just reduced a, a department in a position. Right. Okay. But the science, technology, engineering department is new altogether. Well, it's uh, in name. Obviously, it's the science department is the core, right. and they've taken in uh, the teachers that teach technology, and we've expanded opportunities within the science department in the engineering field uh, to the point where we actually believe that it's very important to name it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's probably one of the things that maybe um, takes us beyond our kind of traditional scope of being a high school. We really, you know, we started this conversation many years ago about how do we um, uh, support STEAM learning at the high school level, and we even talked about reorganizations when we mm -hmm. explored what our high school could look like, you right. know, in terms of our statement of interest, um, and in terms of some of the kind of NIAS reporting that we do. Those are the directions that we're moving in, and this is an initial step for that process. Yeah, because I, I was very pleased to, to, to read in this uh, document the, um, the, the, the sort of the realignment of the departments and yeah. to, to call it that. Yeah. It makes it very clear, transparent, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and just having that alignment, I'm sure, is going to make for some more focused conversations and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and practice yeah. among the uh, Popularity of, of certain yeah. classes as well uh, yeah. on the increase. Good. Yeah. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I'll just ask for a uh, motion to accept the WMHS program of studies as presented. So moved. Second. Motion's made and seconded. Anything else? All in favor? Thank you, everyone. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Thank you. And then I had two quick uh, uh, points on my other um, piece of my agenda. Uh, one is, uh, in recent days, you've seen some communications coming out from me in regard to leadership changes. Um, and in your packet are timelines. Um, I'm very appreciative to Principal Metropolis and uh, Principal Calora uh, for you know uh, knowing how important it is to advertise and start to interview at this time of year to provide us with 
uh, their announcements, um, and uh, so very appreciative of that. So in your packet, I just wanted to outline for you what the, um, the, the search process will look like and what the timelines uh, look like. Um, I crafted emails to parents and community and staff just this afternoon. I was just finishing them before labor. Just put the final touches. They're ready to go. Um, I will um, send those out tomorrow to let parents and staff know how they can participate in the process. Um, and so that, that should all be out uh, tomorrow. Um, and then the other announcement was um, I appointed uh, T.J. Liberti as the principal of the Dalbier School, which was warmly received, to say the least, uh, by the Dalbier community. Uh, very, very happy. He's really doing an outstanding job um, as a principal of that school. And uh, so that was kind of some exciting news um, to share. So um, that's that piece. Uh, did anyone have any questions on that before I move on? Mr. Thanks, Rob. So, Kim, just a question about the uh, principal appointments. Um, given that, um, you know, these, uh, uh, these the uh, retirements, resignations are concurrent with yours, right? Um, and that essentially um, uh, you will be choosing, ultimately it will be your choice, right, um, for uh, two key uh, leadership positions that will continue uh, in, in the beginning, your successor's tenure, right? Um, have you thought about um, uh, Offering, and, and I don't know if you've had, had experience with this uh, in other um, realms, sh short term contracts to assure that, because um, the other way to look at this would be um, to wait to fill these positions with the new, um, you know, with the new year successor, the new superintendent, right? Um, but obviously, that, you know, um, we, I, I imagine you don't want to do that because you want to fill these positions, right, and make sure that there's continuity in the start of the school year. So is one option um, to um, offer, offer these new uh, applicants or the new, the, those whom you choose, um, short-term um, uh, contracts to um, allow your successor to evaluate that person or persons after a year or so, whatever amount so of time. So those are yeah. some great questions. Yeah. Um, and I was just kind of looking at Michael, or seeing if he recalls Mass General Law off the top of his head about a principal's first contract. Um, I want to say that MGL. Um, it's up to three years, so you can award in a shorter contract. I think the difficulty is if you're at that level of administration, yeah. it's difficult you're to recruit. Want a, 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 well, Someone it's difficult to recruit people yeah. if, they, if yeah. you're not willing to commit to them long term. Yeah. Yeah. That's you know, another like, consideration. Yeah. yeah. And I think okay. so. I was I was thinking about MGL, and I was I, Mike usually has that uh, at the tip of his fingers, but um, the, um, but I think w what we're looking for the reason we want to kind of be in the process right now is this is when the best candidates are available. Right. Uh, we want to be competitive, right. and, I, and I would agree with Mike that to be competitive, to offer a shorter term contract would probably uh, not make us nearly as competitive as yeah. other districts yeah. that will be offering, you know, um, the, the typical the typical first contract is a three year contract. Right. Right. Um, so we um, we want to make sure that we are hiring at the optimum time. Yeah. Uh, we'll have participation from a lot of voices in the committee uh, community. We um, for the uh, high school uh, principal, we're talking about putting together a transition team. Uh, that will really kind of help transition the process, even yeah, from yeah. the starting point through the summer and all throughout next year. Um, and certainly, I would just you know um, you know offer to you that uh, you know um, I think that you know you know how much very much I care about the future of not only the Wakefield Public Schools but Wakefield yeah. High School, which means so very much to me as yeah. the former principal. Yeah. And uh, and I will do everything in my power to get exceptional uh, candidates and uh, and selections, and hopefully. Um, you know, the, the next superintendent will be pleased with uh, the work that we do. Yeah, but, uh, yeah I, think, um, I think you hit on another comment I was going to make, which is the importance of the, um, uh, the community uh, coming together. Um, and, and we've, you know, we've done that really, really well um, right. in, in the most recent selections of principals um, well, I think involving that's maybe the parents. The, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think yeah. the other thing really on my mind is, as you know, uh, you know, coming into my final, you know, uh, portion, yeah. uh, I've been very, very intentional about my work in 
you know, hiring, you know, the best possible yeah. leaders yeah. Um, for our schools because it's just so critical to have to have great leadership. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and I, I really feel optimistic and I feel yeah. confident yeah. Uh, about these searches with the amount of really talented people that will be working with me yeah. uh, in finding um, these these leaders. This will not be a decision. You know, ultimately I have to make the final right. decision, right. but um, but there'll be a lot of really imperative voices of people who will be here for the long term. Right. So. Great. Uh, exactly. Thank you. And certainly I, I feel, uh, you know, uh, on a high school principal position, which is a very important position, uh, a good piece of news is I was a high school principal, right. so I bring a lot of experience, uh, kind of really understand the, the uh, nature of that uh, position. So but thank you for asking that. Yeah. Um, and then my, so, and then my final announcement really is just um, one of the students mentioned uh, Learn Anywhere. Uh, we had our first two days of the Learn Anywhere project. Um, uh, I would say that it was overwhelmingly positive feedback, uh, pre-K to 12. Um, I shared with you one email of concern I got several days before it happened, and really that ultimately ended up being the only uh, email of concern. Uh, other than that, it really tremendously positive feedback at all uh, levels. And um, Jeff Weiner, our uh, director of technology, sent to me uh, some data just saying that during the two snow days on January 4th and 5th, a total of 2,326 faculty, staff, and students accessed their Google accounts from home which is really impressive, and uh, so it was very, very active. Um, and then during the two snow days, he just sent me the data to show that Google Classroom, which was largely used by middle school and high school students, uh, was active, um, really commensurate to a regular school day, which was kind of neat. Uh, but I think the thing, um, I'm collecting a lot of information and data that I'd like to share with you, kind of, uh, it's gonna take a little while to organize it, but, um, Pictures and videos and emails have been just flooding in about the incredibly creative and innovative uh, assignments that teachers did with kids. And it's actually super fun to watch the videos, especially the little ones, the things that they did at home on their snow days. Um, so I'm just going to really try to put kind of a complete package together on that. Um, at some point, probably in March, I'll do a survey to um, to families, how, what were their experiences like at home, uh, to students, what were your experiences like, and to teachers, what were their experiences like, to get some data. But I think it's wise to kind of, you know, I think we'll, we'll know a lot more when we've been through the winter about what it looks like overall. But I, I would say it could not have been more successful than it was for our first try. And really, kudos to extensive planning and preparation and um, just to the kids and teachers who really embraced it and parents who really helped us out um, as well. So, and that is it for my comments. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Okay, so we do have an agenda item tonight regarding the superintendent search process. So the um, labor subcommittee has met to discuss this. Um, Mr. Markham is the chair of the Labor Subcommittee, has prepared a document for us tonight that we all do have in front of us. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to our Chair of Labor. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, so the, the document, the memo that you have um, in front of you, what I'd like to do is to sort of uh, walk through it, spend some time walking through it, um, and um, and then obviously uh, open up for conversation and discussion as we as, as we go along. Um, recall that the uh, that the uh, authority or the the direction provided to the labor subcommittee uh, at the last uh, school committee meeting uh, was that we produce such a recommendation that the labor subcommittee uh, would meet. We've met actually twice uh, since the December 12 meeting uh, <clears throat> and, and discussed the process in length uh, in and uh, are making, uh, making a recommendation this evening. Uh, the first thing that we want to do is to appreciate what some of the options, what different processes look like. Um, so on, on page one, there's an outline um, of the really the three fundamental types of process um, that exists um, that is uh, fairly common. Uh, <clears throat> one of those um, options is to employ a professional consultant who does a formal sort of nationwide search, if you will, um, and they uh, are charged with uh, running a, quite an extensive process and ultimately, of course, in each of these options, by the way, the full school committee uh, is the final uh, d determining uh, body in any, uh, in any, uh, in any of the, uh, the, the final actions. But nonetheless, uh, option one is to employ a professional consultant to, to lead a very extensive process. <clears throat> Excuse me, option number two, 
uh, would be to uh, to engage and lead a local uh, locally driven process, employing best best practices and appointing some school and, and community based uh, volunteers and, and leaders from around town. Um, ultimately, to serve such as as a consultant, but uh, without necessarily the trappings of such, without the cost related to such, and also without necessarily the same amount of time uh, that a that a formal search um, such as it is would take. Uh, the third process um, was that, it, or is that, the school committee makes an ultimate uh, direct appointment. Uh, just to remind the committee as well as the the public, there is nothing at all in Mass General Law or in uh, Wakefield uh, policy that requires the school committee to have any such a process. At the end of the day, the law requires and, and, and uh, allows the school committee to, um, to guide and direct the process as it sees fit. So uh, a search process can be quite extensive or can be non-existent. Um, uh, and it's entirely up to the school committee as the, uh, as the appointing authority. So process number one, and I've outlined uh, the bottom of page one and the top of pages, uh, page two, what each, of the, what each of the options are like. Option one involves uh, hiring a, a professional. Uh, we had done so, the Wakefield School Committee had done so uh, at the time of um, uh, when Superintendent Joan Landers was departing. Um, uh, we hadn't hired a superintendent in, in a number of years prior to uh, Ms. Landers. Um, so the school committee at that time opted um, to uh, bring in a consultant and to take a fair amount of time to be to be much more uh, cautious and to go through a very extensive uh, community-based process. Uh, that usually leads to in other communities, and we did it in, at that time, uh, the hiring of an interim superintendent. That can sometimes take six to eight to ten months or more, um, and that's uh, and that's a process. It's also um, a uh, amount of, bu of budget dollars that are affected. Um, uh, I put in this document, it's usually somewhere it's upwards of around $20,000 to lead a, a consultant-driven process. Um, I think we had a very uh, positive, uh, very good consultant-driven process at the time. Uh, we had an interim appointment uh, of uh, Dr. Gary Murphy for a year, and then uh, the consultant that we hired, a, um, New England-based uh, New England School Development Council, uh, their recommendations <clears throat> through that process, and ultimately were the uh, that brought uh, brought us to a vote to hire Dr. Stephen Drake. <clears throat> Option number two, um, uh, which is the one that involves community uh, and community and school-based volunteers, it does not engage in a consultant. Uh, it can be done a lot quicker uh, in terms of, of a couple of months as opposed to a year. Um, and it's certainly something that um, that would involve a, a community-based um, screening committee that would serve almost as a consultant uh, and provide recommendations uh, back to the full committee for the full committee's um, uh, discussion, deliberation, and, and ultimately action. Um, option number three involves the exclusive and direct responsibility of the school committee to really just make an outright appointment. Um, we had done so in this regard in uh, June of 2005 when Dr. Zreich provided his resignation. Um, uh, he gave us about a month's notice. Um, we were very fortunate at that time, one, to within about 24 months had gone through a very extensive community-based process. So lots of the data that we had collected from, from families, from communities, from teachers, from stakeholders, lots of that information was still crisp, was still real, still alive. Uh, I would even argue, and I think we discussed at the subcommittee, I would even argue that lots of that information is still alive and well today. In fact, the work that Dr. Zreich and Dr. Smith have done, both when they were a team and now Dr. Smith and Mr. Lyons have done as their team, um, that information um, that we gathered uh, from that extensive process is, is what has formed quite a bit of the, um, the basis for uh, missions and purposes and, and actions that, um, that, are, that, are, that are well in place now. Uh, so with that, with that in hand, back in June of 2005, we were also in an incredibly good position uh, to have a ready, capable, and fully vetted assistant superintendent in Dr. Smith uh, in place. So at that time, uh, the school committee just uh, made an outright appointment. So, so we're kind of somewhere in the middle. 
um, here we are, at, you know, three years, three years later. Um, so the recommendation, uh, beginning on page two, there are six parts to the recommendation from the subcommittee. Uh, beginning on page two, the recommendation uh, number one um, is that we sort of use uh, a, a bit of a hybrid, that lots of the, we don't think um, that we need to take a year. We don't think we need an interim superintendent. We don't think we need to invest $20,000 or more in, a, in an outside consultant to tell us lots of things that we feel that we we know pretty well and lots of them um, as well as uh, how um, how uh, how much along we are in many in many ways um, so the recommendation under under bullet number one is that the um, school committee uh, opt for option number two so-called and that uh, we employ a um, uh, this is the volunteer services of a screening committee and we engage the screening committee in about a three months worth of effort. Uh, one of the recommendations further on down will be a timeline. Uh, you'll see that in, in a moment. So uh, recommendation number two um, has to uh, do with the definition of what a finalist and semi-finalist are. Um, this actually happens to be rooted in um, some open meeting law and expectations around uh, those terms. Um, that ultimately any any recommendation that comes to the uh, full body uh, must, uh, meaning the full school committee, uh, must be done in open session. Um, it is very typical um, in, to have in the screening committee process or a consultant process that that uh, be allowed to be done in, in an executive session. That um, and I think that that is probably uh, well uh, well uh, needed in this case that uh, hopefully we're going to get a vibrant set of candidates, uh, some of whom may um, understandably at the time not wish to share with their present employer their, uh, that they're looking around and they have every right uh, to do so. They have every right to be uh, you know, vetted and, and go through a sort of semi-finalist process in some level of confidentiality. That, um, so this is really is the definition of that, that, um, that the screening committee would go through a paper process would narrow down uh, to a uh, group of semifinalists whom they would interview in executive session and then provide a list of finalists, however, uh, whatever number that may be, uh, <clears throat> to the full, full committee at that time, those finalists now become public and those, those interviews are then conducted in, in public. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, number three, it has to do with a job description uh, attached here, we do not have a fully vetted uh, subcommittee job description yet. Uh, we've attached here uh, to this document um, the job description that presently exists, so to speak, in the file. Um, it is it is uh, fairly uh, short. Uh, most of the superintendent's job description is prescribed in master in the law, um, so there isn't uh, as far if we were to pull it. The uh, probably the business managers or the sped directors job description that may run on for pages, <laughs> but something that uh, that we're recommending is that uh, we the uh, subcommittee take uh, take a shot at a uh, at what sort of job description we want to put out to the public. Uh, number four on the top of page three, um, we do think that there may be a small budget uh, that may be required. Um, I have no magic to be candid uh, around my recommendation of, of up to $6,000. Um, I do not have extensive research on that, but I do know that the types of things that we're talking about would be advertising, recruiting, printing materials, um, administering the work of the, of the subcommittee, um, and, uh, and then hosting uh, meetings and events. Um, if any candidates were to be out of state, it is very common and is recommended by both MASS and MASC that the uh, that the receiving district uh, reimburse for mileage or travel or an overnight accommodation. So some uh, money uh, is going to be required. Uh, certainly nothing like hiring an outside firm. Uh, so a six thousand dollar number is something that um, that I think is, is quite modest and uh, and and probably probably a little more than we need. But a uh, but probably a reasonable number too as a starting point. Uh, I, recommendation five is the establishment of a screening committee itself uh, for the purposes of this document, which um, it, we certainly uh, want to have a, a vibrant conversation around this table uh, tonight. Uh, hopefully, if, if certainly not at another time, 
Um, but we're recommending a, a nine-member uh, screening committee uh, representing different stakeholder organizations and groups around, uh, around the school district and around town. <clears throat> um, certainly that, there's no magic to that number. So if there's anyone or any representative group that uh, the full committee feels we've left off, uh, we'd just amend this tonight and we, uh, you know, add to it. There's no, so there's no magic to this. So if we've happened to forget someone, it's certainly not uh, intentional. Uh, but having a teacher representative, having a paraprofessional representative, uh, having a representative among the uh, four elementary principals, uh, having a representative of the, of the secondary uh, principals, uh, number six, a representative of the central office. I have put in here excluding the business manager, whom it's quite likely we would call upon to support our discussions at, at a later point. Uh, number seven, have a parent representative um, uh, to be uh, to be named uh, by a, a meeting, a joint meeting of the PTOs. Uh, uh, number eight, have a community at large member uh, selected from effectively a blind drawing uh, by people who would uh, submit their names, and we'd literally draw them from a hat or draw them from a basket of some kind uh, here and here at, at a meeting. Um, number nine is a representative of t town government to be selected by the town administrator that may or may not be the town administrator himself. Um, procedurally, uh, we would ask that uh, each of these representative groups select uh, their representative uh, and inform the, so inform the school committee, and then the school committee actually then, by name, now appoints uh, this, this, this group of people to appoint and authorize them to conduct the work. That's actually something that is uh, critically important, at least for the uh, process, procedures, minutes that this group is being so so delegated to represent us in this task that, that these individuals should be should be so named. Um, item number six is a timeline that effectively starts this evening and, and runs through April 17. Uh, April 17 is when we're suggesting that would be the final night uh, that we would uh, conduct a vote on um, on the employment uh, the employment agreement. Um, uh, looking just very quickly going going through here a couple of couple of dates we would post uh, the job um, on January 24 um, we would have February 1 as the deadline for the representative groups to submit their names uh, to the full school committee for who will who shall sit on the screening committee um, February February 6 uh, we're recommending that, that we the school committee hold a special meeting which is not a regular meeting night, but hold a special meeting to appoint the screening committee members and go, go through that process. Um, uh, February 23, uh, we're ask, we would ask that the screening committee uh, representing us hold at least one parent and community forum uh, to allow members of the public, members of the school community, and members at large to, to attend and, and, and speak and have, a, have an open and, open and appropriate uh, conversation and make recommendations or express concerns. Um, number seven, between February 23 and March 16, um, the, uh, the school committee uh, would, would meet. Oh, also February 23 uh, would be the deadline for applicants, uh, meaning anyone that seeks to apply for this position, the deadline for doing so would be February 23. Then between February 23 and March 16, the school, the screening committee would do its work. Um, and on March 20, um, the screening committee would, would, at our regular meeting on that night, uh, would make public the uh, names of the finalists um, that, that they're recommending uh, for, for our consideration. Uh, the week after that, they're recommending the school committee uh, host a public and in, in some informal gatherings to uh, meet and greet, so to meet and greet the finalists and invite um, school members, uh, invite teachers, staff, students, parents, town officials uh, to meet the candidates, if you will, in an informal way, uh, you know, sort of a, a cheese and cracker type of event, something informal, um, and, and do that over the course of, of, uh, of, of a week. <clears throat> At the top of page four, um, the week of April 2, the school committee would hold public interviews for the finalists, whatever number of finalists that may be. Uh, we would need to uh, decide at that time or somewhere leading to that time, uh, do we do them all in one day? Say we have four finalists, do we do them all in one day? Do them, you know, a couple hours apart or do them over the course of a couple days? Uh, obviously, this, this recommendation was not meant to, to micromanage a process as it needs to be a little fluid 
as time goes on, uh, but right now to say, uh, just to keep us on track. Uh, Tuesday, April 10, uh, according to the recommendation, is when we would expect uh, to vote uh, to appoint the next school superintendent. Uh, we would then have another week or, or another handful of days, rather, to empower the Labor Relations Subcommittee uh, to meet with the superintendent appointee and uh, negotiate terms, employment terms. And then April 17, <coughs> excuse me, would be a special meeting uh, to uh, to vote the, uh, discuss and vote the terms and to make a the final appointment. So this, this memo uh, rec represents the discussion of the labor relations, the votes that uh, we, we had uh, made uh, based on the delegated authority from the full committee, uh, and then the uh, subcommittee's authority to me to craft such a memo and put it in place and make the recommendation uh, th this evening. Um, I want to be uh, very clear. I think the, when we, the, school, the subcommittee met earlier tonight, we want to be very clear that um, while there's a lot here, um, there's not a lot that's controversial here. Um, so, uh, and time is, uh, while certainly, as Dr. Smith made uh, made note with uh, Mr. Metropolis and, and uh, Ms. Clure, uh, we certainly, with her, her notice, giving us plenty of time to make this decision. Time is on our side, but we, but we don't want to drag it out if we truly don't need to. Um, with that in mind, if there's, if we can have a conversation this evening, if the committee is comfortable authorizing moving forward based on what you see in front of you and the verbal uh, recommendation, uh, then we would, uh, that we would appreciate that. Uh, but that being said, if there's anyone that's not at all comfortable with a piece or a part, um, the full committee needs to be quite comfortable in this, in this task. So um, you could certainly send us back to the drawing board, uh, you could, uh, or, or, or something else. But uh, it, is, uh, it is our recommendation that, um, that these uh, six pieces, uh, six steps rather, be, uh, be, be brought forward. Questions, comments, ideas? Certainly uh, the members of the subcommittee are, uh, don't hesitate to chime in if I've gone too fast or gone too slow. I haven't done either. Um, so I would just want to offer my thanks to Mr. Markham um, for drafting this document. I think it makes lucidly clear a firm uh, approach. I fully support it as a school committee member and as a member of the Labor Relations Subcommittee. Um, it's broken down into two sections the way I see it. It's broken down one into the three options that kind of we began big picture. I wonder if there's any discussion amongst any school committee members in terms of preference for that, those options or in terms of how the Labor Relations Subcommittee uh, got, got to our point where we were recommend, recommending option number two, uh, which is a school committee-led hybrid. Anything along those lines at all? I support rep, uh, the option number two. I think it makes full sense. I read through the, obviously read through the minutes from the previous labor. Um, the ones in the packet. Yeah, the ones in the packet, and it seemed like you had, you know, a lot of thoughtful conversations. And, uh, you know, the, the fact that I think there was a comment in there that we've, we meaning not me, but, but the committee has kind of gone through this process a couple of times um, within recent years, I, I fully support option two. Ms. Morgan. I, um, obviously, I support option two also as we went through this with the subcommittee. I do have some thoughts on the screening committee. Um, but do we want to hold off on that and have a motion on the I think if the school committee is first? prepared to adopt option two, then perhaps we can begin with the motion contained herein and then get into some of the nitty-gritty in the, in the screening committee and all of that. Yeah, why don't we just hone down uh, if option two yeah. works for everyone or not, then we can. Mm -hmm. Does that seem to work for everyone, option two? Mr. Leakos. Yes, sure. So I, 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 I agree, I think. Yeah, my instinct when I, you know, when I first heard, um, you know, from Dr. Smith that she was going to be retiring, I, I envisioned something like this, um, knowing what, in general, what our options were. And, and also thank you, Tom and, and the members of the subcommittee for the work you guys all did on this. This is, it's, it's a lot, it, um, and it's very thoughtfully laid out and, and clearly laid out. Um, uh, so yes, I, I I do too. I guess um, you know there's so much here. I and knowing how important this decision is, the final decision uh, for our new superintendent, 
but also the decision on creating the right process for it. Um, uh, I just, I, part of me wants to sink into this a little bit more um, and take a little bit more time. And then the other, the other, the only other concern I had is that we don't have Chris Callan here tonight. Um, has anyone gotten a, had a chance to talk to him about this? Because in other words, I think it would be important to have all of us um, fully s supportive of the process going forward. That that just thinking out loud, that would be um, important too. If 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 we laid this on the table as an alternative, if, if we laid it on the table tonight. And um, and then came together two weeks from tonight, and um, with you know the final a commitment to to uh, approve the process and make any final changes, um, in hopes that we'd all be here, including Chris. Um, maybe that's something to consider. Sure. Th th that's why I made the comments at the yeah. end that yeah. I did. That I'm yeah, I appreciate that. Sure Thank that you. That <clears throat> everyone feels comfortable in, in understanding of what we're laying out. Yeah, and there you. seems to be some. You know, you did a terrific job of, of uh, uh, the chronology um, uh, between now and the and the 17th of April, and I had one question on that too. But but there seems to be some two weeks wouldn't we no, just would have two to weeks would not right we not we would just have down. to cram it up a little bit. And my only my other concern was making sure well, I can't remember when is the town election. The last Tuesday of of April. Of April, okay. So the it's the same. Yeah, okay. So there's no discontinuity between this school committee and the next school committee, right? So that right. was the only other. To be completely yeah. Uh, yeah. transparent to yeah. the uh, to the full committee as well as to the public, it was it is our embedded recommendation, yeah. not uh, necessarily written, but embedded recommendation that that this school committee, as it presently is constituted, yeah, uh, conclude conduct the process and right. conclude the process. Yeah, no, I and I totally agree that that's appropriate. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. So can I just ask sure, a clarifying question? Yeah. So, um, Greg, were you saying that you want to lay, lay on the table the entire proposal or, or just, you know, we agree on option two, but now what you'd like to do is sort of think more about the process? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say that personally I like option two, but I would like a little bit more time just to dig into what is, you know, a uh, uh, lengthy and detailed set of recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, I'm just kind of forecasting where I would where I would go. But yes, it would be to lay the whole thing on the table mm -hmm. this week mm -hmm. and, um, and commit ourselves to a vote in two weeks on it. Mm -hmm. um, and again, in part, I think, also giving Chris a chance to, to dig into it too. I don't know what you know why he wasn't here tonight, but we all miss meetings occasionally. I, I just think I just think it would be in our interest, right, from the beginning, to have the full committee um, behind this. And I well, don't think that I don't think that's going to be a problem. Well, I think it certainly it's, yeah, is one yeah. of our uh, our big two statutory responsibilities. Right. So, exactly. So yeah, this yeah. certainly, and, yeah. and I want to be clear, and I know yeah. the subcommittee yeah. does as well. This is certainly absolutely not intended in any way. Uh, to, to ram something forward right. no, or no, to no. or to drive a, a, a quicker agenda, we right. Right. we took a, a couple weeks or a month or so and and, and came up with uh, came up with the recommendation before right. you. But I also don't think um, that waiting two weeks is going to really dis even disrupt the timeline. Okay. Uh, because what we were going to do, although I would ask, let me say this, let me mm -hmm. think this out loud. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what was inherent in part of this recommendation is that the subcommittee okay. would meet between now and the next meeting and draft a, um, a, a, a vacancy announcement and a posting. Right. Um, so I would ask that that authority be given us right. so we can that can that can be presented right. at the right. 23rd. So we don't lose that time. So we don't because yeah. then yeah. if we lose another two weeks then 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 we've lost a month. Right. 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 So right. if if, yeah. if for that's either consensus or a motion that the Subcommittee be empowered to meet again in the next couple of weeks and bring forward at the next meeting a job vacancy announcement and an actual posting, so we can still then stay on target, looking at uh, uh, you know bullet number three under item six, meaning posting the job 
on January 24. Mm -hmm. We won't lose that time if that's, if that's reasonable to. Right, through the chair, I'm, I'm totally. My thinking is that that, that yeah. would be a worthy yeah. compromise. And yeah. I think that yeah. it would, it would yeah. allow us, the, the, the Labor Subcommittee, the time to go ahead and do that. So yeah. I, would, um, I would ask if there's a motion to empower the Labor Subcommittee uh, to develop uh, a vacancy announcement, a job posting for presentation and consideration at the, 20, the meeting of the school committee on January 23rd. Okay, so moved. Second. Okay, motion's made and seconded. Any discussion on that particular bit? Okay, all in favor. Great. So that is on the agenda for the Labor Subcommittee. Um, <coughs> and then we can certainly return to the point of if there's um, consensus among the committee that we'd like to digest this document a bit um, beforehand. I, I agree with Mr. Markham. I think that process um, doesn't impact the timeline whatsoever, especially given our, our previous vote uh, empowering the Labor Subcommittee. So if there are any thoughts on that, um, I don't necessarily know that we need to lay anything on the table. I, the members could just digest the mm -hmm. digest the. No, we um, could, yeah, we could pretty much. Uh, I mean, our charge was to bring forward a recommendation right. this evening. We've right. done so. Right. Then um, the motion will be the same from right. two weeks from now. Right. Yeah. 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 The one thing that um, um, uh, sort of taking off uh, uh, Kate's uh, comment on what you were about to hop into, I think, if I if I may, if we could be prepared, the most. Um, fluid part of this, or the most engaging, I suppose, part of this would be uh, the, the, the representation around the table of the screening committee. Right, right. I mean, I think that's probably more interesting and more engaging and more informative both to and from the public than, you know, what are we going to, you know, where, where, where are we going to advertise or something. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> uh, what newspapers or what, uh, what websites. So uh, let's just make sure, if we could, to have the, um, the school committee be fully prepared to uh, in addition to uh, or in, in including all recommendations, but make sure that we are able to empower uh, representative groups. Um, and if the committee feels that we've left someone off, it was unintentional, we have no problem adding them. We don't obviously want a group of 50, uh, mm -hmm. but right now it's a group of nine, making it 11 or 13 or something is not going to uh, is not going to complicate uh, complicate things too much. But um, my my final point, perhaps even now that we have time. Uh, <clears throat> I would imagine that there may be some uh, coverage of this process in, uh, in tomorrow's paper or the paper after that. That I'd certainly encourage any member of the community that thinks that um, there's a representative group uh, that we should include. Uh, certainly, we should welcome that. Send uh, Mr. Tier or myself an email, and uh, that's something we can we also bring forward. But we want to make sure that we uh, uh, get this taken care of at the next meeting, so we can proceed. Yeah, okay. Thanks, thanks for, um, again, thanks for your hard work and for considering my point of view. And mm -hmm. I think, Sorry. you know, I think in, in the end uh, we'll be better for it. So, great. All right. Um, anything else from the school committee from the chair of labor on this point? Okay. And with that, we will go to our subcommittee reports. Mr. Callanan is not with us tonight, but I believe their last meeting was canceled due to the snow. Is that right? Right, and we rescheduled it for this Friday at okay. 7.30 a.m. Okay. And then we had a previously scheduled one for the following Friday, so two consecutive Friday mornings coming up. Okay, Labor and Personnel. Mr. Markham, anything else? No, no I believe, I, I believe I've, I've waxed on enough this evening. <laughs> Policy and planning, Ms. Fortier. Uh, we haven't met. Okay. All right, future dates and agenda items. Our next meeting will be on the 23rd of this month. School Committee comments. Mr. Massey. Ms. Morgan. I'll say. Mr. Liakos. I'll say. Ms. Forty. Uh, I just want to remind uh, the members and the committee about the Martin Luther King uh, celebration on uh, January 15th. Uh, I believe it's at 10 o'clock at the Galvin Auditorium. Uh, it's, a, it's a very nice event, um, and so I encourage folks to, to join. I forgot. Sure. Something. I remember correctly, your state, uh, Dr. Smith's state of the schools address is this mm -hmm. Thursday evening, Correct. too. So that's another, just a reminder. I'll send that another yeah. public reminder, yeah. but thank yeah. you. Okay, yes. mm -hmm. thanks. Yeah. Mr. Markham. I'm all set. Thank you, sir. Great, as am I. So with that, is there a motion to adjourn? I make a motion to adjourn the um, uh, school committee meeting of January 9, 2018. Second. Motion's made and seconded. All in favor. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>